Okay, we're going to do chapter 5. We're actually going to only do half a chapter 5 because it's a pretty long chapter. And again, the book we're, we're doing from is this one right here. The Poor Man's Way to Prevent uh, Dementia and Raise IQ. I got my old uh, Stanford Wrestling Coaches on there, Mark and Dave Schultz. Um, just so you know, my other book, I'm kind of writing a series of books called The Poor Man's Way. So this is The Poor Man's Way to Fight Cancer. I already wrote that one. came out, I don't know, about six months ago. So if you're interested in cancer, this is the book to read. It's the same sort of book. What's unique about the Poor Man series is I got lots of uh, illustrations in there, um, which my earlier books, I didn't know how to illustrate them, so I don't have illustrations in them. Uh, okay, so we'll start out here with this picture of the two patterns of atherosclerosis. There's the Western pattern of atherosclerosis, and let me, let me scroll the page up a little bit. It'll make more sense. The Western pattern of atherosclerosis, which is coronary artery disease, or typically called heart disease, and of internal carotid artery in the neck, cervical carotid artery. This is what you get from eating a high-fat diet. The other pattern of atherosclerosis is especially, is called Asian atherosclerosis, and you know, in particular, let's say the Japanese pattern of eating a very high sodium diet. They're also smoking a lot of cigarettes, and that causes vasoconstriction and hypertension, and they tend to get increased intracranial atherosclerosis, which is associated with increased risk of stroke. Okay, all, I mean, all hypertension, all atherosclerosis is associated with increased risk of stroke, but in particular, that was characteristic of their pattern, because you would see, you know, catheter arteriograms of a bunch of intra cranial atherosclerosis in some of these East Asian Japanese persons and you would see more of a typical coronary artery disease and cervical carotid atherosclerosis. The word stenosis means narrowing. That's the medical word for narrowing of an artery. You'll hear that all the time in, in medical literature on atherosclerosis. And um, we talk about atherosclerosis. The most important thing to know about atherosclerosis is atherosclerosis is a blood clot. If you understand that, everything else will be able to make sense to you. Versus if you don't know that, you'll, you'll be stuck like a typical medical doctor and they really don't know almost anything about atherosclerosis. It's really kind of a joke, their knowledge of atherosclerosis. Also, um, I wanted to say, what was else? There was something else I was going to say about the brain from last lecture. Oh, the reason, too, I talked about sleep making you smarter is that, you know, once your brain neurons are cleaned in the morning when you first wake up, that's the smartest you ever are because your brain is optimally clean when you wake up in the morning. In addition... When does an animal need to be smart? An animal needs to be smart when it's hungry. After you've eaten a big dinner, you don't need to be smart. It's a good time to go to sleep. But in the morning when you wake up, you fasted overnight. You get a little burst of cortisol and catecholamines. That's in a good way to kind of maintain your blood glucose in the morning. And then you get a little ghrelin stimulating your hippocampus, making you smart. So you are the smartest you get in the morning. And I'd actually say one of the best study skills you could have is as soon as you wake up, sit down and start studying. Because then you start getting interested in whatever it is that you're doing. You build some momentum and you'll get lots of studying in or academic work for that day. Because I know a lot of young students that are having problems. And typically they're doing stupid things like they get up in the morning and they go exercise or they eat a big breakfast. That's all stupid. You sit down and you start studying first thing. That's when you are smartest. Do all your most challenging work. You know, real serious scholars, they know that, okay? All right, so anyways, these are the two patterns of atherosclerosis. Uh, we're going to go through this stuff more. You can see that typically occurs at a branch point, and there's one big branch point in the neck. Common carotid already bifurcates into external carotid going to the face, internal carotid going up to the brain, but it's much worse situation in the heart. There's tons of little bifurcations in the heart. So you get coronary artery disease, you get atherosclerosis plugging up lots of locations in the heart. That's why there's no such thing as single vessel disease. That's in particular the work of William Roberts who showed that it's never a single vessel in the coronaries. It's always diffuse. Okay, the atherosclerosis. Okay, now we're going to show you just, you know, two graphs of blood pressure. So here's a normal blood pressure. Let's say it gets up to about 110, and the lower number is in the ballpark of about, you know, 70, 110 over 70. That'd be a pretty good normal blood pressure. The pulse pressure is subtracting the upper number, the first number here, 110 minus the lower number, 70. So this pulse pressure would be 40. Okay, that's a normal and a good pulse pressure. 
<clears throat> the, the difference between the systolic and the diastolic. So the number on top is systolic when the heart's contracting. The number on the bottom is diastolic when the heart is relaxing. Now here is a hypertensive patient. The systolic number is way too high at 200 and the diastolic number is too high at 100. Okay, And this pulse pressure of 200 minus 100 is 100. That's a high pulse pressure. What's bad about a high pulse pressure is it tends to be damaging to the small arteries up in the brain. Okay, and over time, that hypertension causes atherosclerosis in the intracranial arteries, and you get those little small strokes in the uh, deep white matter of the brain, like I was showing before in the in the last lecture. Okay, in the, in the lecture, yeah, in the last lecture, chapter four. Okay, right now again, we're in chapter five A. All right, so we'll talk some more about what's going on with high blood pressure and how that affects the brain. Oh, the best way to avoid high blood pressure is eat a low fat, low sodium diet. The fat makes the red blood cells stick together, and that makes the pressure have to go up in order to pump them through a capillary. Because the red blood cell is bigger than a capillary. Red blood cell is about five. I'm sorry. Red blood cell is about seven microns in diameter. A capillary is about five microns in diameter. So it already has to deform itself to squeeze through. But when they're all stuck together because of the fat meal, then pressure has to go up more. Okay. Potassium, magnesium, or vasodilators. You get those from plants. So are the nitrates that you get, like say, from eating the greens. Okay, so that's all good. All right, now we're going to talk about the Winkessel effect. Okay, so Winkessel effect relates to your ascending thoracic aorta. It has a bunch of elastic fibers. So when the heart contracts, that's called systole, it pumps blood into the ascending thoracic aorta. The ascending thoracic aorta is then pushed outward by the pressure of the cardiac contraction. And then that energy is stored as kinetic energy in the elastic fibers of the ascending thoracic aorta. Then when the heart relaxes, those um, elastic fibers in the ascending thoracic aorta will recoil inwards. And that generates flow during diastole. Diastole means cardiac relaxation. And so in a sense, the ascending thoracic aorta is functioning like a second heart. That's your second heart, the ascending thoracic aorta. Now here's the problem. These elastic fibers, if they're repeatedly overstretched due to chronic hypertension, they cannot be replaced after a person reaches, reaches you know, physical maturity. So let's say about 20 years of age. So if an American stays hypertensive, let's say from their teens through about 40, those elastic fibers are all gone, all right, almost all gone. So they're going to lose their ability to generate significant diastolic flow. And that's a problem because diastolic flow helps you to keep a narrow pulse pressure, which protects the arteries in your brain. In addition, diastole is when most of the blood is traveling through the coronary arteries, especially down into the intramuscular segments. So if you got less diastolic flow, less ability to generate diastolic flow intrinsically because of a le less elastic fibers in your ascending thoracic aorta, that means you need a much higher systolic pressure. When you need a much higher systolic pressure, then the heart has to pump harder and pump longer. And so you can't perfuse that cardiac muscle until diastole and your diastolic ability to pump is weak. So you see it's a double screw job for the cardiac muscle. So pumping harder leads to left ventricular hypertrophy. The left ventricle gets thicker. That's a hypertrophy to get bigger. And um, it, it doesn't fill, it doesn't perfuse as well for the reasons we just talked about. So again, a double screw job. Bigger cardiac muscle, less time, and less ability to adequately perfuse that cardiac muscle. You see how you're starting to trend towards having a problem oxygenating the muscle of your heart. Okay, so the wind, wind castle means a thing that like, like, yeah, looks like an accordion. You push on it to blow air onto a fire. When you're trying to start a fire on the kindling, that air can kind of puff it up and get the kindling to burst into flames and initiate a fire. So that's called the wind castle effect. I see on CT scans of the chest calcifications all throughout the ascending thoracic aorta, aortic arch, all the time. It's routine to see that in Americans over the age of 60 and especially over 70 and 80. It's real common. And if they're in kidney failure, man, they get it right away. Um, kidney failure patients have terrible atherosclerosis and calcifications of their artery. Okay. All right, now here's a picture of like what we were talking about with the red blood cells. This is a 7 micron average diameter of a red blood cell, so 7 microns, that's worth knowing. 5 microns is the diameter of the capillary, 
and you can see the red blood cell because it's bigger than the capillary diameter it has to deform back on itself a little bit to pass through this means that the red blood cells have to be flexible okay um, they also call it RBC deformability is the usual word um, now there's certain things that are bridging molecules a bridging molecule is something that sticks red blood cells together and when you have red blood cells all stuck together that can be called rouleau rouleau is a French word for stack of coins so if the red blood cells are all stuck together by LDL cholesterol, by fibrinogen, the clotting molecule, um, by uric acid, then, then it's almost like pushing a quadruple decker submarine sandwich through these capillaries. Pressure has to go up more. So remember, blood pressure has to go up to get blood to the top of your head. That's the main reason because it's pumping against gravity. And then it also has to push harder when you're pumping all these RBCs stuck together. It's like a milkshake instead of pumping normal blood that's more like water. Okay, so increased thickness of the blood is called increased blood viscosity. And explaining atherosclerosis based on these principles of blood thickness um, and also with the idea that atherosclerosis is a blood clot, that is called atherothrombosis theory of atherosclerosis. And trust me, it's the best one by far. It, it, it includes all the other concepts of atherosclerosis. They're all subsets of atherothrombosis theory. So yeah, atherosclerosis is a blood clot. That's super important to understand that. That's like the key thing to make sense out of atherosclerosis. Okay. All right, now I'm going to show you the best book ever written on atherosclerosis. This book right here is called Blood Viscosity, Its Role in Cardiovascular Pathophysiology and Hematology. Um, also, you might have heard me speak about atherosclerosis before. Basically, who knows it the best? It's the pathologists who know it the best. When I was young, I was a vascular interventional radiologist, imaging-guided surgeon, trained at Harvard in that field, and I thought I knew atherosclerosis, okay? And I had friends who were vascular surgeons, friends who were cardiothoracic surgeons, friends who were cardiologists. And we kind of thought we are the atherosclerosis experts. But the reality is we didn't really understand atherosclerosis that well. What we were is plumbers, okay? Plumbers in the sense that we know how if there's a narrowing, a stenosis, we can put an angioplasty balloon in there and open it up, pop a metal stent in there to keep it propped open. We could, you know, inject clot dissolver to dissolve a fresh clot of atherosclerosis. But we didn't understand it the way the pathologists do who look at it under a microscope. Also, the reason why a surgeon will never ever write anything that useful about atherosclerosis in my experience is because they have to always promote surgery. That's what they do. And medical medis, medicine is not open-minded. It's not like real science, okay? If a surgeon were to say, gee, we're stupid to be doing these bypass surgery. We, we ought to be putting these patients on a vegan diet. They would run that guy out of town. Same thing with a cardiologist came out and said, gee, stents kind of stink. They don't really don't work very well. We shouldn't be doing this. They would run that guy out of town. These are billion dollar businesses, okay? So they're not going to listen to some regular person come along and criticize their own field. They will, they will make life difficult for that person if they do it. And so and then the cardiologist or the internal medicine doc prescribing pills, there's tons of money in that. But we talked about it before. What's the cure rate for all that stuff? Zero. What's the cure rate for a low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet? Close to 100%, like um, Esselstyn diet. And the reason I tell you about it, the author of this book, by the way, was Gregory Sloop. So Sloop is S-L-O-O-P there. And um, he really figured out a lot of the key things in atherothrombosis theory. And this is his book. It's really simple to read. You can read it in one week pretty fast, and it just makes sense out of everything. And then also, I, you know, I've looked at many thousands of catheter arteriograms, CT angiograms, magnetic resonance angiography, MRAs, okay? Atherothrombosis fits everything. Everything makes sense with atherothrombosis here. With the other theories, you can't, you can't get there. Um, with all the cholesterol ideas, vasovasorum theory. I mean, there's some useful stuff in all those theories, inflammation theory, infection theory, Okay, the odontogenic theory, all that stuff. There's some useful ideas in all of them, but the only thing that puts it all together is, is atherothrombosis theory. Um, and this is the best book. I actually was so fascinated by the book, I called the guy up and I, and I talked to him because uh, I wanted to make sure I understood everything. And um, I did. Okay. Um, 
Because, yeah, the, path, the, the pathologist doesn't care. The pathologist doesn't care what you treat atherosclerosis with, a pill, a stent, a surgery. They could care diet. They could care less. They just look at it under a microscope. They're the ones who actually see what it is. Okay, so um, this is the concept of a zeta potential. A red blood cell has a negative charge cloud around it, and that negative charge cloud around the red blood cell repels other red blood cells, which is good. You don't want them sticking together. So that's the red blood cell zeta potential. And this has been known for a long time because they have to bank blood and they don't want it clotting, all right? But no doctor knows this. You won't find a doctor who knows this. I've never seen a single doctor know this until after I taught them. And that includes, you know, all these, you know, attending physicians, residency physicians, fellowship trained physicians, etc. And I didn't know it. And I, like I said, I was specially trained in vascular disease. Okay, so red blood cells can have a bridging molecule come between them with a positive charge on its outer surface that will overcome the zeta potential and stick them together. So typical things that are bridging molecules is fibrinogen, you know, becomes fiber in the clotting protein. Uh, LDL cholesterol will stick red blood cells together. Uric acid will stick red blood cells together. So IgM antibodies will stick red blood cells together. So that's an important point. And that can initially cause Rouleau formation or blood sludge, but it can also uh, progress to a full blood clot, atherosclerosis itself. Okay, and white blood cells also have a zeta potential, and um, the endothelial glycocalyx has a zeta potential. So the next question is, well, where does that zeta potential come from? Well, the negative charge, it comes from, in part, these things called sialic acids. So a sialic acid is a lot like a glucose with a carboxylic acid attached to it. There's a little bit more to it than that, but that's the basic idea. And this is worth knowing. Sialic acids are part of the negative charge, the zeta potential on the outer surface of cells because they're also part of the immune identification. So we're not going to get into all the sialic acids now, but I guarantee you this will come up again later. There's also things on the outer surface of the cell that are negatively charged like cholesterol sulfate. Whenever you hear the word sulfate, think of negative charges. Okay, and then there's also heparin sulfates. Whenever you hear those things, Think of negative charges, okay? So that's really key. Negative charge on the outer surface, uh, red blood cells, other blood cells like uh, white blood cells, and of the endothelial lining and its glycocalyx. Okay, here's a movie that came from Dr. McDougall's YouTube channel, and it's called Blood Sludge, Blood Flow Before and After Eating a Fatty Meal. And um, this video is well worth your time to watch. You remember this the rest of your life. It's only about 50 seconds long. There's no, there's no words. You just read the words on the screen. And this was a research project done by Roy Swank when he's looking in the cheek pops like a hamster. And after it was fed a high-fat meal, all the blood cells sludge together. So they'll call that blood sludge. Okay. Chylomicrons can stick the red blood cells together. Uh, LDL cholesterol stick to red blood cells together. They're all both examples of bridging molecules. Okay, and so I show you this because once all those red cells are stuck together, you get a decrease in the oxygen and glucose delivered to the tissue by about 15 to 20 percent. And that's actually a very big deal because remember the Warburg effect, what transforms a cell into cancer is when you drop its oxygen delivery by about 35 percent or more. So you're already getting pretty close there, dropping 15 to 20 percent with the high fat meal, and then you start superimposing things upon it like um, uh, sodium being a vasoconstrictor, lack of potassium and magnesium, more vasoconstricting, tightening of those arteries, okay, and you can make the blood thick for other reasons because you're stressed out. You're going to keep on dropping that oxygen glucose delivery lower. Uh, you're sleep deprived. You're having caffeine. All of those things are making you more prothrombotic, okay, and they're going to increase the likelihood you're not getting adequate oxygen delivery to your tissues, and that's a giant part of cancer causation, and that's why you know, even though the Japanese were smoking a lot of cigarettes and the, the Papa, Papua New Guinea, they had like six times less lung cancer than the Americans because the Americans were, also, were smoking plus eating a high-fat diet. And that combination of smoker-related hypoxia with the high-fat diet-related hypoxia uh, led them to get more cancer. So anyways, it's a good meal. It's a good movie. Well worth your time. 50 seconds. You'll remember it the rest of your life. That's why you feel lousy after you... <clears throat> when you were younger and you would eat at a greasy spoon type of place. Roy Swank did tons of research on the effect of blood flow on tissue and the effect on the blood-brain barrier. In some hamster brains, he's, he got even as much as a 35% uh, drop in blood flow to the brain in one uh, paper. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, here's a picture showing you LDL cholesterol and its relationship to blood viscosity. 
The higher the LDL cholesterol, the higher the blood viscosity. And as far as cholesterol goes, the number you want to know is total cholesterol of 150. If patients keep their total cholesterol below 150, they almost never have a coronary event. And that's based on the Framingham study, the big study that came out of Boston, the Harvard study. And it's also based on you know, the Esselstyn uh, research work. And if you eat low-fat vegan, you tend to have a really low total cholesterol. Mine usually bounces between 90 to 120. In T. Colin Campbell's book, The China Study, he had some provinces in China where they're eating, you know, close to a vegan diet and low-fat vegan diet and you know, all that rice is 1% of calories from fat. And they had entire provinces where the average total cholesterol was around 93, okay? And you know, places like that, you'll have like no one dies from heart disease. Yeah, there was some study where they checked what percent of patients die from heart disease, and it was next to nothing out of thousands of patients. Okay. All right, a little bit about normal blood flow. So normal blood flow is what's called laminar. So laminar means that the velocity profile is kind of like my hand. The red blood cells are in the center, and then the white blood cells are adjacent to them, and then like my thumbs are where the plasma is. So you can see red right here in the center for red blood cells, and the blue arrow represents white blood cells. And then the uh, black arrow here represents plasma up against the glycocalyx of the endothelium, the lining cells of the artery are called the endothelium. Okay, and that's a normal velocity profile of blood. And that's what the endothelial cells expect to see most of the time. Okay, so when the red blood cells come up through the common carotid artery, they then come to the bifurcation where the external carotid artery goes up to the face, internal carotid artery goes up to the brain. And a lot of them are going to bounce against this median divider. So there's always going to be some turbulent flow. Turbulent flow is chaotic flow, okay? And there's also going to be some retrograde flow. Retrograde flow is also called eddy currents. But when this is present in excessive amounts, it confuses the underlying arterial lining cells, the endothelial cells. And they will start to shed their antithrombotic glycocalyx, the part that prevents clotting, and they will express prothrombotic molecules underneath that, and blood clots will form there. Anybody who looks at catheter arteriograms or CT angiograms, they will see this all the time. This is where it always occurs, the initial clot. So the initial atherosclerotic plaque is a blood clot along the far wall away from the median divider. And you'll then have circulating endothelial precursor cells that come along and cover it up. That's how the clot gets subendothelial. That's worth knowing as well. As people get older, they have less endothelial precursor cells, and their ability to keep this clot under control gets weaker. So the steady state starts fading towards... Um, bad events and they start being more prone to tossing little emboli up into their brain. I can tell you I often see little tiny pieces of calcium in the brain in the arteries along the cerebral convexities due to they call them atheroemboli. Emboli is when a particle breaks off and moves distal. Athero because it comes from atherosclerosis so there's an atheroembolus distally. Okay. Um, I see those I see those almost every day. Little calcifications here and there in, in people's um, uh, convexity arteries and that's thought to be the way it happens it's thought that it doesn't happen in situ typically for that is you know our best understanding of it okay well anyways um, that's what happens that's what it looks like and that matches reality okay and that's a typical pattern this happens at every bifurcation in your body okay you get a lot of atherosclerosis in the lower extremities people with hypertension because there's higher pressure when you're standing up your blood pressure is harder because you got gravity going to it to speed it up even more and you get a lot of atherosclerosis in the coronaries because there's tons of bifurcations in there. Okay, here's normal endothelial cells. And in a normal endothelial cell, the most important thing to know is the nitric oxide. So the endothelial cell produces nitric oxide and it's a gas so it diffuses out of the cell, it diffuses into the arterial lumen, the center of the lumen where the blood flows and it acts upon the platelets to make them not clot. It makes them, so it has an anti-thrombotic effect, okay? And then it diffuses back into the arterial wall and this orange stuff here is kind of not fully shown on the straw in here. I can make it show, one sec. it goes into the vascular smooth muscle cells here and it causes them to relax so that if, if they wrap around the cell and if they contract 
the, the diameter of the lumen of the artery gets smaller. So when nitric oxide comes back, it makes them relax. Now there's other things that the endothelial cells do. One in particular that is worth knowing is they have these heparin sulfates negatively charged on their glycocalyx, the, the proteins e extending upward from the cell. It's kind of like little trees on a hill is the way you can think of them. And they combine with something called antithrombin-3. And both the negative charge and the antithrombin-3 are very antithrombotic. They help prevent clotting. Okay, and there's other things endothelial cells do, but we're not going to get into all of that now. The most important thing is to know this nitric oxide. You have to know that. That's a very big deal. And the reason, too, one thing is I went to the Caldwell Esselstyn, you know, course, uh, training course many years ago. And he was talking and he's telling the audience nitric oxide this, nitric oxide that, nitric oxide this. And I'm like, well, hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? And he's like, we'll get to that later. We'll get to that later. We'll get to that later. And he came over and he talked to me. Uh, afterwards, later, and he said, Pete, I know you mean well, but we can't get into all that stuff. He says, if you go into too much detail, the only thing that happens is you confuse people. And if they're confused, they won't be successful with the diet. He says, for people to be successful, they have to understand nitric oxide. If they get nitric oxide, they'll follow the diet and they'll get a good result. And if they don't, they won't. Okay. And I kind of laugh because there's a stereotype in medicine that surgeons just, all they care about is results. They don't care about the details, okay? That's sort of very typical of a surgeon. And Esselstyn, he got the, he got the results. He deserves a Nobel Prize, that guy. But that that's kind of an old joke. You know, the surgeon, they call him sawbones and stuff, and they tease him that they're not that intellectual in comparison with an internal medicine doctor. Internal medicine doctor, quite often, they'll spend the whole conference debating the subtleties of some little minor point. And the surgeons mock the internist, you know, calling them the fleas because they're always drawing blood like a flea. And, you know, call them analysis paralysis or mental masturbation. That's the joke about internal medicine type fields. Those are sort of like the two main areas of medicine are internal medicine based and surgical based. There's other areas, of course, but those are the two big ones. Okay. Here's this word. You need to know this word. It's going to come up more. Um, glycocalyx. So glyco kind of means sugar. But when we say sugar in this context, we mean like a structural sugar. Uh, and structural sugars can do things. There's nothing to do with dietary eating a sugar. Um, calyx means like a coating. So glycocalyx means like sugar coating on the outer part of a cell. And what it really relates to is the zeta potential. When I hear the word glycocalyx, I'm thinking zeta potential. And we talked about the glyco glycocalyx negative charge. Zeta potential is made by its sialic acids, its heparin sulfates, and its cholesterol sulfates. Okay, so here are some um, endothelial cells, and they're shaped like spindles. And normally the blood flow, which is normally laminar, travels along the same direction as their long axis, okay? And that's relevant because they're designed, they've got little mechanoreceptors on them, and they sense the blood flow going by, and it hits these little things, like little hair cells almost. And when they feel laminar flow going by, they're happy. That causes them to keep releasing more nitric oxide. Everything is good, copacetic, okay? But if they have an excessive amount of turbulent flow, it, it confuses them. Is there a, a vascular injury at this point? Okay, if there's a lot of retrograde flow going backwards, it confuses the mechanoreceptors. All right, and they'll start to shed the outer glycocalyx, the antithrombotic stuff, and the underneath it will be these prothrombotic molecules like VCAM and whatnot that are now exposed and can cause binding with white blood cells and red blood cells, and you don't want that. Okay, typical red blood cell lives about 120 days, and then it goes to the spleen. The spleen is the graveyard for red blood cells, okay? When a red blood cell is younger, first comes out of the bone marrow, it's more flexible, more deformable, okay? Um, as it gets older, it becomes stiffer, less able to deform itself to pass through the capillaries. And that's also why um, women live longer than men, because a woman's menstruating. So every month, she's lowering her... Uh, hematocrit, the, amount, the percentage of red blood cells she has in her blood. And by lowering that hematocrit, that makes her blood thinner, more like water, less like a milkshake, so that lowers her blood pressure. In addition, new red blood cells to replace the old ones that were lost from menstruation come out of the bone marrow. They're fresher, they're younger, they're more deformable, more flexible. That also lowers blood pressure. And that's why women live longer. They got less hypertension, therefore they get less strokes. Okay, um and they get less intracranial atherosclerosis. But then when they're postmenopausal, they lose that benefit. Oh, another thing that causes red blood cells to become stiffer with time is 
the phospholipid of, of the plasma membrane and you know along the outer surface of the red blood cell. One of them, real important ones, called phosphatidylserine. I abbreviate it PS. The PS starts moving from the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane to the outer leaflet. That's called uh, externalization. So phosphatidylserine externalization causes stiffening of the red blood cell uh, plasma membranes, and that makes them less deformable. And in the in the spleen, the capillaries are about three microns, so the spleen will remove the older red blood cells because they're not deformable enough. It's like doing the limbo, going underneath the limbo to get under to get through these three micron capillaries. So. That's how the spleen removes um, the old red blood cells. Okay, this is a picture showing you phosphatidylserine externalization. So what's happening here is, here is the phospholipids. So the blue is for the phosphate. These are the fatty acid tails. You have a glycerol backbone in there, and there's like you know three carbons on the glycerol. And so one goes for the phospholipid, the blue thing, one goes for this fatty acid, and one goes for the other fatty acid. So that you know, explains the, the connections of the three uh, glycerol carbons. Okay, so anyways, these red things are the phosphatidylserines. As the, and this is the cytoplasm in here. Here's the external uh, world. And what happens is with time, more of these phosphatidylserine phospholipids, they flip the red ones into the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane of the red blood cells. And this makes it stiffer. So phosphatidylserine externalization is another way that red cells become stiffer as they age. Red blood cells normally are very deformable. They're incredibly deformable. That's why they work so well. And that's why women live longer, because they menstruate, and it's essentially a therapeutic phlebotomy. What I've seen is a lot of women, if they get a hysterectomy, man, they have much worse outcomes than they would expect. If a woman gets a hysterectomy at a young age, between the ages, let's say, 25 and 35, they have a dramatically increased risk of hypertension, including severe hypertension, and everything that leads to uh, coronary artery disease, uh, congestive heart failure, stroke, dementia. And I think the reason is a guy starts seeing his friends have problems when they start getting around 40 years of age. Some guys are becoming impotent. Some guys will have coronary artery uh, <clears throat> chest pain and go for a stent or have a myocardial infarction. So if they have a brain in their head, they get scared and they start watching their diet and you know, being aware of blood pressure and of uh, atherosclerosis. Whereas a woman tend to think the whole thing's a big joke, a premenopausal woman. They don't have, none of their girlfriends has a problem with this sort of thing. So if they get a hysterectomy, they still think they're like all the other girls, all the other ladies, but they're not. Now they've now assumed the same risks as a man does. They're going to be iron overloaded. They're not going to menstruate. They don't get that protective effect. So a lot of them become severely hypertension, hypertensive. They never get a check by a doctor. And then they show up at an early age, you know, being demented or having, you know, congestive heart failure or myocardial infarction and things like that. So whenever I see a demented brain on a young female, when I say young, I mean, let's say, you know, 60 years of age or less, I first look for all the usual suspects, you know. And if I don't find it being a typical thing, uh, you know, she's not a smoker, she's not an alcoholic, she's not a drug addict, um, then I always go checking in her post-surgical history, and I very often find she had a hysterectomy at a young age. Most common reason for the hysterectomy is because of fibroids. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about how a glycocalyx is made. A glycocalyx comes up a lot, so it's good to have an idea of it. Here's the endothelial cell. It means arterial lining cell. It's plasma membranes. It's always a phospholipid bilayer. So the phospholipids face outward. They're charged. The hydrophobic fatty acid tails face inward against each other. So this is a real hydrophobic um, area in the center of the plasma membrane. Okay, then you've got these core proteins that stick up out of the plasma membrane of the red blood cell and of other cells, okay? And they're typically called a proteoglycan, okay? Proteo for protein, glycan for a sugar component that's going to be added to them, all right? And then you can have repeating disaccharides. All you need to know is these are things like heparin sulfates, okay? And um, these have a lot of negative charges on them from all the sulfates. And these will attract water because water is polar. You know, it's got a slight positive charge on the hydrogens. Water is H2O, so there's two hydrogens, one oxygen, and a slight negative charge on the oxygen. So the positively charged part of the water molecule will be attracted to the negatively charged sulfates of the glycocalyx. And you ever heard the expression slippery when wet? Well, that's why it works this way, because it makes the endothelial glycocalyx very slippery so the red blood cells can slide through there, which you need that to be that way because, again, the red blood cell is bigger than the, um, than the diameter of the capillary. Of course, it's folded back on itself to pass through, 
but it's also the case that this glycocalyx is quite slippery. And when you think about it, there's about 99 red blood cells for every white blood cells. But the white blood cells are even bigger. They're even like twice as big as the red blood cells, like 14 uh, microns in diameter. So it's much more difficult to push them through a capillary as well. So they really benefit from this super duper slippery surface from all the water attached to these uh, negatively charged um, sulfates, sialic acids. Okay, and cholesterol sulfates are in there as well. So anyways, that's how a glycocalyx works. You got this, this core protein with heparin sulfates attached to it, tons of negative charge for a zeta potential, okay? Um, here's an example of a sulfate with a double negative charge on it, all right? And here's the water dipole. Dipole like, means a, a, a partial charge. Okay, so again, why does it have the uh, why does it have the uh, the zeta potential so that stuff doesn't stick to it? And they got the same thing in the in the cartilage of the joints. You've also got you know uh, a lot of zeta potential going on, and you got water attracted to the negatively charged uh, proteoglycans of the glycocalyx. And you know here they are, but they're born to they're they're attached this time, let's say, to a hyaluronic acid. It's sort of like the base connector protein. And that's how it all works. So this is another reason why it's also good to get your sunshine. The sunshine helps to actually support this healthy type of sulfate that's located as part of a glycocalyx and part of your cartilage. Okay. The other thing too is you'll hear that lady, Senef, she talks a lot about um, the effect of GP, you know, the stuff sprayed on the uh, non-organic uh, soy and whatnot and some other crops because that can <clears throat> deplete the sulfates from the glycocalyx um, and from the cartilage is, is her perspective and that can uh, decrease their function. So just be aware of that. Oh, actually one more thing before we talk about it is when you, let's say you jump or something, they're like shock absorbers. All this water attached to these um, glycosaminoglycans with all the heparin sulfate or chondroitin sulfate, so usually chondroitin sulfate, especially in the cartilage. The water molecules bounce off when you when you're, you land, let's say you jump, and then they come back on. And so that's the, they form a shock absorber when you're walking or running or doing any type of sports activity. That's how cartilage works. Okay, here is um, a plasma membrane of a neuron. So neurons are your brain cells. They'll have an inner charge inside the cell of about negative 65 millivolts, okay? And they have these potas potassium sodium pumps that pump more sodium out, three sodiums for every two potassium pumped in. That's how they generate this negative charge. And that's like a battery. You have a charge separator, and then you have charge accumulation, and then you have charges traveling when the ions, a positively charged molecule is called an ion. And so later on, when you open up a channel and rapidly let a charge through, that creates a current. And that's how cells do their work. So this negative, negative charge here is an electrical gradient. Because you build up a high concentration of sodium outside the cell, you then have a chemical gradient, a concentration gradient. And so at this point, because there's more, about 10 times as much sodium outside the cell as inside the cell, sodium really wants to come into the cell. And that can be coupled to doing other useful work like pumping calcium out of the cell. So this is called a NACA exchanger. Na for sodium, Ka for calcium, X for exchanger. And it works like a water wheel. This concentration gradient of sodium is coupled to pumping calcium out. You need some energy to pump calcium out because you're also pumping that against its gradient. And so in a neuron, up to two-thirds of the cell's energy is used to run this pump. That's why I also like to write this gradient as negative 65 millivolts because that reminds you that that's about the percentage of the cell's energy that's used to run this pump. That's how important it is. It's super essential to running that pump so it can do all the other work that it needs to do across that plasma membrane. Okay, and... In the modern world, people eat way too much sodium and far too little potassium because potassium comes from plants. Sodium is high in processed food and typically on meats. 
And because of that, they tend to be depleted of potassium. They tend to be depleted of magnesium. You need magnesium as a cofactor for ATP-related reactions because ATP is adenosine triphosphate, trias and three phosphates, and it grabs on to the second and third phosphate and keeps them together as long as necessary. Without that, they would pop away from each other earlier. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is magnesium comes from plants, potassium comes from plants, and there's other good things from plants, and that's where you get them. And if you don't eat plants, you can be low in these things. These are very common deficiencies in America, and you can't run your sodium potassium pumps as effectively as you would like, nor can you run your NACA exchanger as effectively as you would like. And the net result of all this would be you'll tend to accumulate calcium inside the center of a cell. I'll go over this again, but I'm just letting you know that's a really important point in cell physiology as it relates to hypertension, and it's going to relate to dementia. I'll go over it again, but I'm just letting you know this is key stuff right here from being able to make sense out of what happens inside a cell. And this also explains why I strongly recommend you know, avoiding excessive dietary sodium. Humans are designed to eat a lot more um, sodium, I'm sorry, a lot more potassium than sodium because we're designed to eat plants. Now this book right here is also on the top 40 list of the best medical books ever written. The author's name is Richard Moore. He's an MD, PhD. He basically dedicated his life to studying uh, plasma membrane ion pumps and their relationship to hypertension and other diseases. Okay, And this book called High Pressure Solution, he came to the conclusion after, you know, about 50 years of studying this stuff. The most important thing is to eat at least five times as much potassium as you do with sodium to get your plasma membrane pumps to run effectively. And as a matter of fact, our ancestors probably ate about 25 times more potassium than sodium. You know, Dennis Burkett had said, humans are the only animal that eats more uh, sodium than potassium. And that messes up our ability to control our blood pressure and it also affects our neurotransmitters. Because calcium is like the on switch that um, that uh, makes a cell do whatever it's supposed to do. Okay, here's going to show you now what's happening with magnesium. So magnesium binds to the the second and third eight phosphates on an ATP molecule, adenosine triphosphate, and its positive charge helps hold those two phosphates together. It's like holding a big, powerful horse before you let it go. Okay, and when it lets this phosphate go. That'll be a, a major step in lots of uh, reactions in the body. Many, you know, thousands of reactions in the body are dependent on ATP. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the energy currency of a cell. It's like a, the equivalent of a $20 bill in the cell for getting stuff done. Okay, so then the next question is, where does magnesium come from? And here's where magnesium comes from. Magnesium comes from chlorophyll. It's in the center of chlorophyll. So it is basic to the nature of a plant to have magnesium, all right, from its chlorophyll. That's just sort of a fundamental thing about a plant, all right? Just like, you know, from an animal, you have uh, iron in the center of heme. This is very much like that concept. So iron, we are overloaded in iron. We don't want any more iron, the vast majority is. I realize there's some people who are anemic and, you know, women who are menstruating could potentially have a problem with that. But the vast majority of people I deal with, <laughs> they are iron overloaded. That. That's another reason to avoid meat. And most people, the most common deficiency in America are fiber, potassium, um, and uh, magnesium, and that's from eating plants, okay? And nitrates from eating plants, okay? And antioxidants from eating plants. So if you eat the plants, you get what you need. Okay. Uh, oh, and this quote here was from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Above all, love each other deeply, for love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to each other. Use whatever gift you have received to help others. And I say that, you know, as a metaphor and a sort of a joke is that if you just eat the plants, all kinds of good things just happen. You don't really need to think that much. A lot of these, you know, blue zone people, the longest lived people in the world, they live in, you know, bum, you know, podunk, okay? And they're not scholars. They don't know anything about nutrition. They just eat the local plant foods. So you don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be a scholar. Just eat the low fat plant foods and good health follows. Okay, so here's what's called the K-factor, as described by Richard Moore. And uh, so basically he says you got to keep your K-factor, which means ratio of potassium to sodium, at least 5 to 1. At least 5 to 1 to have a decent blood pressure. Okay, and again, it's very easy if you eat a plant-based diet to be 10 to 1, 20 to 1, 
way up there because a lot of plant foods will have a hundred times more potassium than sodium. Okay, the other thing that happens is you've got osmolality. So if you're eating more sodium, what ends up happening is our kidneys help us to maintain a fixed amount of each ion, of, of positive ions and negative ions, okay? So the more dietary sodium you eat, our kidneys are designed to, to urinate out the potassium. We're kind of designed to conserve sodium, so we're not designed for a high sodium diet. And if you eat a high sodium diet, you will tend to urinate out more and more of your potassium, and that will dissipate your gradients on your plasma membranes and make them less effective to run. So you really don't want to do that. Psychological stress causes you to piss out more of your magnesium, so then you're also losing that magnesium, and you need them both. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to go in a little more detail about how a cell works. Um, this right here is the um, plasma membrane of a cell and a neuron. And here's the same pump we just talked about: the potassium, sodium, ATPase. So it's called potassium because it brings potassium in, sodium because it pumps sodium out, ATPase because it uses an ATP for energy to carry out this pumping job. That establishes a negative charge inside the cell, the electrical gradient, and because you're pumping more sodium out than this in, sodium is accumulating outside the cell, so that's a chemical gradient, a chemical concentration gradient. Together this chemical concentration gradient with this electrical gradient are called electrochemical gradient. And this means that sodium, which is now 10 times higher outside the cell than inside the cell, 140 versus 14, really wants to get into that cell. So if you allow some sodium to come into the cell, that generates energy because it's coming down its electrochemical gradient. And that can be coupled to other work like pumping calcium out of the cell. Calcium has a very high concentration outside the cell, and you're pumping against that gradient, so you need energy to be able to do it. Calcium is the, the like a light switch. It turns cells on to make them do whatever they do. So a neuron releases its neurotransmitter when calcium in the cytoplasm goes high. If you were a muscle cell, you would contract. If you were a beta, a beta cell in the pancreas, you release your insulin. So calcium coming up is a real important concept in cell physiology. You know, the old joke like Lord of the Rings, one ring to control them all, one ion to control everything. It's like the boss aristocrat says, do this now, okay? All the potassium and sodium, they're like, they're like worker ions, okay? He's doing as they're told, the manual laborers. All right, so big deal. When calcium concentration goes up <clears throat> in the cytoplasm of the cell, its neurotransmitter is released. Like glutamate is the most common neurotransmitter in the brain. Okay, and that's going to become really important for understanding the brain. Okay, um, let's see. We talked a little bit about the ion pumps. We don't need to get into this too much, but there's there's two major ion pumps. There's the NCX, the NACA exchanger, we talked about that. That one's super fast, okay? Um, the PMCA, plasma membrane, calcium ATPase, that's slower, and that runs more continuously, and that's in every single cell. Whereas a NACA exchanger is especially important in things like neurons and muscles where you have to pump calcium very quickly. And we talked about how <clears throat> the concentration of calcium is really high outside the cell, 10 to 1 compared to inside the cell. With potassium, it's just the opposite. It's about 10 to 1 in the other direction, much higher intracellular. Okay, with calcium, there's a giant gradient. It's like 10,000 to 15,000 times higher concentration outside the cell than inside the cell. That's why whenever you're pumping calcium anywhere, you're almost you're always pumping it with a gradient in terms of what, what's relevant to us. Uh, pumping it out of the cytoplasm into the extracellular matrix. Pumping it from the cytoplasm into the endoplasmic reticulum. You're going to need to use ATP or be coupled to ATP in some form um, in order to do that. Okay, so that becomes relevant. Na for sodium is for natrium, which is the Latin word for sodium. K for kalium, kalium is the Latin word for potassium. So you will hear those phrases. Okay, we're going to stop at this point, and we're going to call that chapter 5A. Uh, tomorrow I'll do, you know, the second part of this chapter. We'll call that 5B. So I hope that was interesting and helpful to you. And the key point was the fact that, you know, everything that cell does depends on that plasma membrane electrochemical gradient. That's why sodium and potassium are so important and we're designed to eat uh, lots of plant foods to have a lot more potassium available to optimally run those gradients and that'll also give us our magnesium and we want to keep our 
are sodium low. So it's more of a ratio than anything else. So, um, and that's how a cell does its work, and that's how a cell prevents hypertension. And when you have high sodium and low potassium and magnesium, then you get hypertensive because the cell stays chronically contracted because its cytoplasm calcium is high, the vascular smooth muscle. So anyways, I uh, hope that was helpful.